Welcome back to the RN to Writer show. I am your host, Elizabeth Haynes, and I built a six-figure writing business in my spare time. It seemed like a good idea. And today, I'm so happy to welcome as our guest, my good friend, Marika Vroman Derning. I almost tried to do that in the Dutch by rolling the R, but I knew that I would screw it up, so I did not do that. But let me tell you a little bit about Marika. She went into nursing school right after high school, which in Quebec, which is where she is located, is at age 17. After many years of working the bedside and as a clinical supervisor and instructor, she began writing and editing medical and health information around 1993. So yes, we have one of the original nurse writers with us today. After dislocating her shoulder in a freak accident, Marika gave up clinical work permanently in 2010 and focused on writing and editing ever since. She has written for various print and online outlets such as Costco Connection, Forbes.com, Parade, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and many more, and is currently the director of content for um, the Sepsis Alliance. When asked for an elevator pitch, Marika usually says that health writing is like the patient bedside teaching nurses are supposed to do, but never have time for. Man, I couldn't agree more with that. And instead of sharing information with one patient and family at a time, she's now reaching thousands of people. Thank you so much for being on the show, Marika. It's good to be able to chat with you. It's been a while since we chatted, I think. It has. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. One of the first things that I wanted to ask you about was how did you come to discover that you could be a writer? I mean, this was back in 93. This was before the web, basically, not before the web, but before the web had, Mm -hmm. you know, become huge. So, yeah. So how did you find out that you could be a writer? Well, I always wanted to be a writer and my parents were very highly educated. My father was the university professor and my mother was a teacher and they all said you couldn't make a living as a writer. You had to choose something practical. And um, so I chose to be a nurse um, because I knew there would be a job no matter what there would be always be able to find work. But I never lost the love for writing. And I grew up with computers. My father taught mechanical engineering and computers and he helped develop the computer lab at McGill. So um, I grew up around computers, so I was an early adopter of everything computer-wise. And so in the early 90s, I was online with a very slow modem, and I discovered um, some sites that were looking for content. I remember writing a few pieces for free just for the joy of writing, and one of the first ones was on Alzheimer's, and I think it was just after Ronald Reagan was diagnosed, so it was around that time. And the more I looked at it, the more I liked it. I didn't know I could do make a living with it. And then when I was working as um, a head nurse at a camp for physically handicapped children, um, there was a teeny tiny little ad in the Montreal Gazette that was some, they were they were looking for a nurse with good writing skills and who knew how to use computers. I'm like, hey, that's me. And uh, I applied for it and I got it. Um, it was for a company that doesn't exist anymore. They were ahead of their time. They were too much ahead of their time. And then when I when that company went under, I started working for Doctor's Guide to the Internet, where I was an editor. And then I was looking at what my writers were doing, and I was thinking, hey, I can do that. They were writing briefs of, of articles and, and conferences and things like that. And then I just, one of my writers became managing editor at a patient education place, and she knew I wanted to write. So she asked me to write a few pieces, and it just kind of went on from there. That is awesome. And before the audience jumps on me for saying this was before the World Wide Web. This, I do know when the web was invented. So, but what I want to say is there were not a lot of people on the web in 93. It was not a big thing. You know, I and would you were say. Working with, you were working with very, very slow modems. I had a 2,400 2, baud modem. That it was like, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't practical to work on the internet back then. No, exactly. Um, I remember Doctor's Guide to the Internet. That was oh, yeah. a big site. I mean, yeah. that was... They, st- they still exist, but not in the same way. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I started freelancing on the side in 94. Um, and it was all 
snail mail queries to magazines. Like yeah. I certainly did not have internet access at the time yet, well, about five years later, probably. So that really fascinates me that, you know, you had a computer and you were online and you were doing this stuff um, so early. Um, that's amazing. You should, your next book should be about that. Your that's history cool. of writing for the early web. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, anyway, you subsequently progressed into editorial positions, correct? Yeah, I have worked as a managing editor for a few different places, and um, but it's it's not my love. I I do like to I like to copy edit. I don't like to do substantive editing, and it's I, I find editing actually harder than writing. I much prefer to create the the piece and have somebody else edit it. But um, I still do. I still have a couple of clients where I do some editing and proofreading and things like that. So I'm going to take this opportunity to pick your brain a little bit. Because I've just, I've had some questions lately from the, the nurses who are in my programs who many of them are just starting out. Many mm -hmm. of them have only discovered the possibility of a writing career um, through RN to Writer. And so when you, when you say managing editor, could you explain to the audience what a managing editor generally does? Yeah, um, the difference between a managing editor and a copy editor is a copy editor is you, you're just literally editing the copy that comes across your desk. If you're a managing editor, you generally um, are responsible for finding your writers, assigning the articles to the writers, making sure they submit them on time. And you might do the copy editing or you might pass it on to a copy editor, depending on how large the, the company or the organization is. So when you were serving as a managing editor and people would send you letters of introduction, I'm assuming, or potentially um, article pitches, depending on where you were serving as a managing editor. Can you tell us a little bit in general, what sorts of things you looked for or what, what might make an LOI stand out to you? Um, well, there's the obvious basics, but unfortunately some people don't take them to heart. Um, make sure that there's no spelling mistakes um, that I hit the delete button right away, except, I mean, there are some times where the store, where the pitch, let, the pitch is so compelling or the LOI is so compelling that I'll let the spelling error go through because I mean, I make them too. When, and so I, the best, I, the best way to find it if you have a spelling error is press send because you'll see it as soon as you see it. <laughs> you know, so spelling mistakes do happen. But try really, really hard not to, because if there's more than one or it's like a really obvious thing that, you know, it wasn't a typo, um, I, I tended to delete those right away because I had so many. Um, the other thing is make sure you know who you're pitching, because as an editor, there are a few things worse than getting an LOI or a pitch that has nothing to do with what I'm doing. And I get a lot like right now as a writer, I get a lot of pitches from public relations people and they're not even remotely close to what I cover and um, it, it's it's irritating and if I had a writer send me something that does, isn't even remotely close to what I'm doing if they sent me a second one if I recognize the name I might not even look at it again um, because the first one was so far off the mark it's just like really know who you are um, pitching to know the name if possible of the person you're pitching to spell it right um, I know my name can be hard to spell, but it's not hard to spell if you directly copy and paste it. Um, so like a lot of the, the polite things that we're taught on how to reach out to people, you know, don't, this might be a generational thing, but I hate it when I get an email that starts, hey, I just don't like it. <laughs> you know, so keep in mind the, the generation that you might be pitching, you know, I mean, it's a personal thing. Other people don't mind getting, hey, I don't like it. So I think it's easier to stick to the basics, you know, dear so-and-so or hi, good morning, good afternoon, you know, something that is less gut, you know, like a, something that might make you react in, in a, not in a bad way, but, you know, just keep in mind that all generations of people do these, do this work. Um, the other thing is don't assume that the editor is a he or a she. Uh, I get a lot of dear Mr. Durning because they don't recognize the name Marika. You know, so so, tr so keep that in mind. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but if I have several letters to choose from, I I will choose the one that has the least number of 
those mistakes or errors or things that I don't really like. Um, and, you know, it really does come down to gut, you know, does, does this person, does it, from reading the letter, does it look like this person can write what I want? You know, it, it is the letter really long, lots of passive voice, lots of explanation that isn't really there. Web writing is very short and concise. You know, academic writing is different, but web writing is short and concise. So write your LOI in the form of the article that you would write grammatically, that sort of thing. That's, that's, those are sort of the things I look for. And of course, you really need a compelling story. You know, look at the magazine or the website to see if they've already done something on that topic. If they have done something on that topic, how is your approach different? You know, it might have been a year since we covered a topic. So there might be new studies, there might be new medications, there might be new whatever. So why should you write the story and how does it differ from something that's already there? So that's pretty well it. Wow, so much useful information mm -hmm. in there. Thank you so much, Marika. I mean, just to encapsulate, you said, you know, focus on the fundamentals, yep. spelling, punctuation, it needs to be there. I agree with you completely about using a more standard greeting. I usually say hello, hello, mm -hmm. so and so. Um, mm -hmm. I do, I do think maybe it's a generational thing about the hey. I mm -hmm. work with a lot of younger people, and they say hey. But I know yeah. too. I, I loved what you said about write your LOI in the style of what you're right. proposing to write for them. And I think that a lot of um, aspiring nurse writers don't realize when they write to me, I'm using the same I uh, on what they write me, not in a judgy way, like not, I don't think you have the talent to do this. What I mean is I, I get messages from aspiring nurse writers that are writing in texties yeah. you know it's got it, it, very little punctuation like and maybe they did just bang it out on a thumb keyboard while they were on break um it, that thought crosses my mind but what i think to myself is if you want to make your profession as a writer every time you write something you should be mindful of how it's going to be perceived by the recipient and you should make it as good, um, as clean, as engaging as possible, because that's how you want to make your living. Right. And I, I feel like you validated that in your response, you know, especially if you're sending an LOI to somebody or a pitch to an editor, make sure it's clean. Well, I, uh, you can also look at it as a first interview. If you're going for your first interview for a job, you're going to make sure you look decent. You're going to make sure your hair is combed, well, like mine, <laughs> you know, but you're, you're going to make an effort. So it's, it is an interview in some respects, you know, you're introducing yourself and you want the person to see what you can do. And um, it's a one-sided interview, but in a way, that's what it is too. Your hair is legendary, Marika. <laughs> it should have its own fan club. I think sure. it's, it's gorgeous in my opinion, but I understand the curly hair thing. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. It's your first impression. Yeah. Um, I think there's a fine line between getting really uptight and wound up and making, creating the perfect LOI that doesn't get sent right. and balancing that with have someone else look at it or yep. run it through Grammarly or, you know, take advantage of, you know, compose it in Word and then fix any formatting when you paste it into your email or there, I think that there's a balance there. Like, yeah, exactly. don't let perfectionism stop you from sending it out, but do make sure that, you know, it makes a good first impression. Yeah. <laughs> I think for sure. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. So I, I had said, I just came out of my um, stat program group coaching literally 10 minutes ago. I told them that I was interviewing you. And I said, one of the things I love about Marika is she has opinions and she does not hold back from her opinions, which I think is fantastic 
honestly, like I saw something you posted on LinkedIn about stop asking us for free sample stuff because it's crap and we're yeah. fed up with that. Like, I don't can't remember if you said it or I think somebody said it in the comments of your post of, you know, if, if you're going to hire a plumber, you don't say, but I want you to fix this faucet for free first yeah. so I can make sure that you know what you're doing. I mean, come on. Yeah, anyway, exactly. I wanted to ask you specifically when you've been in an editorial position working with freelancers, what do freelancers do that drove you insane? Um, not usually the first article. It would, well, the basics goes back to the basics. Make sure you're, you're doing your, your spell checks and you're sending it in as formatted. Um, some editors are very picky and they want like a specific font and they want a specific size. And if that's what they say you, they want, you have to do that. Personally, I don't care. It just takes a click to put it the font and the size that I want. But if the editor says send it in Ariel 12, send it in Ariel 12. Don't send it, send it in New York, Roman, whatever, 10. Um, it's just going to be one added irritation for them. Uh, for me, it's, it's the ones that don't listen to instructions. So if I say include um, two images and you don't, then I have to email you back saying where are the two images that you we need. Um, if we say not to include a certain type of, of reference, and you do, then we have to go back and either rewrite that part with an appropriate reference. Like, for example, one client I have, there are only certain types of organizations that they want, and I can't use like a commercial one. And sometimes, unfortunately, when I was an editor, I would get that sort of thing. I'd say, don't use this. And sure enough, the next article would be that as a resource. Um, the other thing is what really bothered me is when a writer didn't ask for help when they needed it. Um, don't tell me the day before the due date that you need an extra week because I have my time planned. And if I'm, if I'm waiting for a writer to deliver me something on Thursday because I want to post it Friday and you tell me Wednesday it won't be ready until the following week, then I've got a problem. Now, I tended to give myself some leeway so that when, because I know things happen too. I mean, if, if, if you're in a car accident or something or your kid is sick or something, of course, you're not going to be able to get it done. But lots of times it was just they couldn't get to it, especially if they're using, they're working as a writer on a part-time basis, then their schedule gets out of control and they just don't have time to write it, which happens. I understand that. But let me know on Monday, not on Wednesday, because then I can find a way to replace it. Um, and I, I, I think it was more, more the courtesy things than anything else. You know, answer me. If I send you an email asking you why the article hasn't been submitted yet, or if I have a question about something, answer me. If you don't have time to answer me, say that. So, got your email, I can't answer you right now. Don't, don't just let it go into the, the, the world because I don't know if you've gotten it or not. Then I might send you a second or a third email, then I'll be upset and then you'll be upset because I'm hassling you. So, you know, keep an open line of communication with your editor um, and, and make sure that your facts are right. Uh, unfortunately, I've had a few articles where the facts didn't seem quite right and I double checked them and it was like, you know, that number is wrong or the, the source's name is spelled wrong. Um, when I do editing, I always double check the names and the, the, uh, usually the university or the hospital. And just to make sure, because we all make mistakes, my editors sometimes find mistakes that I make. And, uh, but it's like double check. So, but if you make consistent mistakes, I don't have time to check everything. I'm depending on you. I've hired you as a writer. I've hired you for your expertise, which includes research. So, you know, the odd mistake here and there, we all make them, that's not a problem. But if you're consistently making mistakes, then, then I'm gonna seriously think about whether I will use you again for another article. I thought it was illuminating when I interviewed Marna Palmer from Studio ID, and she was talking about um, looking for writers or evaluating LOIs, and the, the phrase she used was, take a risk or take a chance. She said, I, if, I, if I like don't see a, a strong LinkedIn presence or a website, I don't know whether I should take a chance on that writer or not. And I have told my mentees, this is how editors view you, that mm -hmm. it's, it, it's risky to hire freelance writers. And again, 
so much great information in what you were just saying, which is, though, I want to point out to the audience, entirely attainable, like, like you didn't make you didn't say writers need to be Hemingway just now, you said, spell sources names, right, follow the style guide or the instructions you're given. Um, double check your facts. These are all very simple things. And I would like to think that actually nurses are somewhat better at those things than other people, because we, we have to be so detail oriented and so precise in our clinical work. Like, you know, we have to double check that insulin dose, you know, we, and it's like, treat, treat your writing work that way. Double check your facts. Like it's a, an insulin dose, you know, um, yeah. because when you do that, you, well, the other thing that I heard you saying that you didn't say explicitly was don't make work for your editor. Right. Like to me, this is good customer services. Make your editor's job as easy as possible. Um, communicate with them. There's another important thing is that um, if you make a mistake, and I have to say I did uh, last week, but it, it wasn't that I made a mistake, it was that I didn't have good enough direction. So when I wrote the article, when the editor read it, because this was not what I was expecting. So I apologized profusely because I knew I didn't have enough direction. So I should have asked her for more. Instead, I thought I knew what I was doing. So I wrote back to her right away and I said, I'm really sorry, I did not mean to cause you extra work. And if I get an email like that in my editor's role, it's like, okay, these things happen. No big deal. We'll work it out. So important for all the aspiring and novice nurse writers in the audience who are listening. Um, just what you said is I, I get the sense that these novice writers are afraid to communicate anything bad or negative to their contact or their editor. And it, the situation is quite the contrary. We all as writers run into situations, gosh, I know you and I, you and I have run into situations over the years many times where, for example, sources no showed us mm -hmm. and we had to contact our editors and say, I, I can't, I couldn't get this source. I'm trying, I'm scrambling to line someone else up, but I can't deliver on time. Those things happen. And it's not like you're going to get fired from the project necessarily if you contact your editor to tell them this. Um, indeed, it's better to call them as soon as something like that happens or, you know, email them and say, oh, no, you know, so suddenly things are going south. Or like you said, you know, my schedule got away from me. Um, I'm doing my. And sometimes the story doesn't work. We've all had an, an assignment from an editor. And we think, yeah, this is really cool. And then we start to research it and we start talking to people. It's like, there's no story. Exactly. We have a mutual client that, that that happened to me more than once because sometimes these story assignments come from people who are not even um, in the editorial end, they're on the SEO end. And they're right. like trying to construct a story around keywords. So yeah. they want a story on, you know, some topic that has these keywords and you start looking into it. And like you said, oh, there's no story there. There's yeah. really, really nothing I can write about that. And with health and medical writing, usually the editors and the assignment people don't have any medical background or health background. So what seems to them like a really good idea is you're like, no, oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's not a good premise. Exactly. I think, especially those of us who are nurses turned writers, we all have funny stories where people tried to put together like health topics that just are totally unrelated. Like write us a, you know, write us a story about how blood sugar can, you know, give you psoriasis or, you know, and you're like, no, <laughs> so that just doesn't happen uh, in health, in pathophysiology. I don't think there's anything there. Um, anyway, so that that was terrific information that I, I appreciate you sharing all of that because I know the audience is going to take away, first of all, a sigh of relief of, oh, good, whoo, if I email the editor and say something is going on or I need more direction. Mm -hmm. This is something earlier this year, after how many years of doing this, I had a situation that you, like you just described, where I got 
an assignment, thought I knew what I was doing, and then went, oh, no, I need way more details about this and had to go back to my editor, I think, a couple of times. And she was not annoyed with me at all, because the more you can work that out in advance, the better the story is going to be when it gets to the editor, you know? Yeah. Um, So anyway, so now you are the director of content for the Sepsis Alliance. And it's, it's Sepsis Month, right? It's Sepsis Awareness Month. It's our 10th um, Sepsis Awareness Month. And um, I'm, I'm, I am a freelance writer, but I'm a part-time contractor for Sepsis Alliance. And uh, so if you go to sepsis.org, that's uh, if you, all the, the patient facing, the consumer facing uh, information, I wrote most of that. So, and that's really what I love to do. And it's, it's educating people about sepsis. And there are other um, parts of the site, which are professional for, for professionals. I focus more on the patient and the family. Now, did you have a special interest in sepsis when you approached them or did it start out as another LOI or something? Uh, it was another one of those little ads. It was actually a Craigslist ad back uh, and the, the head office is in San Diego. And um, I was at that time, I was just looking through a Craigslist ads and I saw something about a journalist who knew how to write about infections. So I wrote to them and I said, Hey, not only am I a writer, I'm a nurse <laughs> who used to work with patients who had sepsis, so I can bring a lot to the table. And um, that was over 11 years ago. I'm still with them. That's that's amazing. I always appreciate um, seeing your posts on sepsis because I think it's so misunderstood. I myself don't have the greatest grasp of like what constitutes sepsis. And it's so educational to read what the Alliance puts out. Uh, So helpful. Well, it's great because I I use my writing skills, obviously, but I also use my nursing skills because part of my role is I decide what topics should go up and, you know, how they're related. And for example, we have a section called sepsis and. So there's sepsis and diabetes, sepsis and natural disasters. And what I do is I take a condition or a situation and tie it to how sepsis can become an issue with that with that condition or problem so it's great because um i use my knowledge and i use my experience and i'm able to do my writing and then i also do like news articles i I check to see what's in the news uh what's really important like i just finished writing an article on um, the so-called twindemic that people are afraid of the flu and covid so how is that related to sepsis well both flu and covid lead to sepsis. In fact, severe COVID is viral sepsis. So, um, you know, I'm able to, so it, it's great because so not only can you be a freelance writer or editor when it comes, when you're a nurse, but there are other positions that you can also do that are related with research, fact checking, anything like that. And, and for me, it's a really perfect fit. And for them, they not only got a writer, but they got somebody who can answer a lot of medical questions because we get a lot of emails from the public. And, um, Uh, When I first started, I was the only one with a health background with the organization. Since then, other nurses have joined. But um, having that nursing knowledge made me, um, I don't want to say valuable, but it made me really part of the team because if somebody would say, you know, how does this work? How does that work? I was able to explain to them. And um, so it just, it it just makes me feel good that it's a, it's a role that, that fits me well. And um, there are a lot of roles like that out there. So if somebody has enough experience with their writing and then they combine it with their nursing, there's a lot they can do. I'm wondering, and this is a question I get um, quite often from nurses, is do you, do you ever feel concerned, what, especially when you're writing something like um, information on sepsis for consumers, do you ever worry that someone is going to sue you or something, or you're going to get in trouble for giving medical advice as a nurse or anything like that? Um, it, it occurs to me sometimes I'm very careful in that I back everything up. So if I say um, sepsis kills 270,000 Americans a year, there's a link on that number so that you can go back and you can check where I got that from. Um, it may, anybody can sue anybody for anything. Uh, there was an article that I wrote for Costco Connection about uh, lactose intolerance. And I got the, the longest email, longer than the article was, telling me everything I got wrong in the article. But it turned out he was a biochemical professor, retired 
biochemical professor, and he wanted me to talk about how the proteins didn't break down properly. And all. it was a 600 word article. <laughs> like, come right. on. you know, so the concern is always there. Um, I unfortunately can't get a liability insurance because I'm in Canada and American companies won't insure me and Canadian companies won't insure me for work in the US. So I'm very careful about the contracts that I sign. Um, I make sure indemnity clauses are wiped out as much as possible or they make sense. And, um, but the concern is, is there, you know, because anybody can sue anybody for anything. We know somebody who was, it, she was lucky that she had insurance, um, but she, it was a, a nuisance suit, but it, I think it was like something like $35,000. I don't remember the exact number, exact number. Um, that the insurance had to cover to, for them to get rid of the nuisance suit. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even something medical. So yeah, I, I tell people, you know, the the chance of getting sued is pretty minuscule. I mean, in the course of our career, we've known one person and it wasn't even in the health field. Um, but I mean, it's always there. And the indemnification clauses today are just nuts. So yeah. I, I, I had media perils insurance the last couple of years I was freelancing because there's only so much you can do. Um, yeah. Can you... Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to freelance from Canada? Because we do, we've had so far in our program, we've had nurses from six different countries in the world, um, including Canada. And I, I mean, I know that the rules and regulations for every country, if you want to freelance for like US companies or just companies outside of your native um, or your citizenship or I'm sorry, your domicile, where you're living, um, are different. But what's it like in Canada? What um, special issues do you run into or how does it work? Um, well, when I first started freelancing, I sent LOIs to a ton of U.S. companies and organizations. I did that because um, I live in Quebec and even though I'm fluent in French, I can't write in French. So I, well, I could, but you wouldn't be able to understand most of it. <laughs> um, and Canada, the, our, the, the pay rates and everything are not as high as in the US. So, uh, so for some reason, I never really approached Canadian organizations. I just flooded US organizations with my LOIs and, and pitches. Uh, I do have some Canadian clients now, but I started with the US. The only difference is that we fill out a W-8 form instead of a W-9 and that's telling the IRS that we're paying our taxes in Canada um, and sometimes it takes the client a bit of convincing that I can write in American I can write British English American English Canadian English which is a hybrid of the two um, I can write it that's not a problem uh, sometimes I have to double check my spell checks to make sure I catch all the, the Canadian spellings as opposed to the U.S. ones um, and some companies won't hire me there have been a couple that one company told me they don't hire foreigners. I don't think of myself as a foreigner, but you know, um, one told me they don't hire aliens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, there was one company that I went through several interviews and they loved me. They really wanted me. That's what they kept telling me anyway. And then they said, Oh, but can you get a license, an RN in, in an American state? I was like, no, <laughs> I have a Quebec license you know um so i didn't get hired for that so there is a little bit of that but uh, the vast majority and as you can see from my experience um most of the time it's not a problem and um i get paid in u.s funds and i have an american account in a canadian bank so i get a u.s check or a u.s transfer and it goes straight there and i'm just wondering what difference would it make where your licensure was like that that makes no difference whatsoever if you're an RN, you're an RN, you're an RN. Or... Yeah, and I remember when I when I graduated, um, many of my colleagues over the first few years went, Texas was looking, Texas and California was looking for a lot of, they came up here to recruit Canadian nurses and they automatically took our Quebec license and switched it to a state license. So, um, you know, yeah. I don't know what their hang up was, but you know, it is what it is. No, and I, um, I appreciate it in, in, the bio that you sent me that you noted that you went into nursing school directly from high school because a, a lot of nurses ask me if their educational level is relevant. And I always tell them, 
No, I mean, I think the more education you have, the more you can use that as a marketing advantage. You know, you can market yourself as, you know, a master of science in nursing or a nurse practitioner or whatever. But I don't think that if you can write that your educational level matters at all about succeeding really in this business. You're right. And I do feel self-conscious sometimes when I'm interviewing people who are like MDs and PhDs. And, you know, um, I've interviewed several nurse practitioners who have doctorates. And sometimes I do feel a little, no, I have an RN um, kind of feeling. And also because I grew up in academics, it does kind of chafe at me a little bit. Uh, But I think, you know, I don't have a formal writing background. I don't have a journalism degree. Uh, I did study languages later, but that was more out of interest. And um, I study translation and uh, I really just, I just love language, something I really like. And, but um, I don't have any more formal education after my RN. I do have university courses, but not a university degree because I'm from the generation where you didn't have to have a bachelor's first. You could go straight into the RN. So now it's morphing that they want everybody with an RN to get a bachelor's. Um, but it, I don't think it's held me back. If it has held me back, I don't know. Well, I was going to say, from your history, we can see it has not held you back because you're the content director for the Sepsis Alliance now. So that's a pretty highfalutin title. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I I share your little trepidation, though, about I, I never went to journalism school either. And I have always, for the most part, refrained from ever describing myself as a journalist because of that. I call myself a reporter. And in some places, I do call myself a journalist when it matters for SEO. But describing myself, because I don't have that J school degree, I try to, I just feel too self-conscious to call Mm -hmm. myself a journalist. I just call myself a reporter. Anyway, well, I thank you, Marika, so much for taking time today. I want to point out to our audience that gorgeous quilt hanging behind you. Marika is a renowned quilter. Tell us the name of your Facebook group. Uh, it's My Creative Quilts, and I have the website with the same name, mycreativequilts.com, and uh, where you can see me complaining about how I'm making mistakes when I'm quilting. I like to teach quilting, and like with writing, I tell everybody, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to. That's right. You know, I just made the ugliest quilt ever last week. It was so bad. Yes, but that is the only one I've seen. That The one that you shared the most recently where it was different quilting on like every petal of the flower. Yeah. Oh, I could not get over how beautiful that was, Marika. And I gave it to her this morning. It, yeah. It's do you gave it to her this morning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. awesome. I bet she was <laughs> I'm sure she was thrilled. Yeah, sure. Well, again, I want to thank you, Marika, for taking time. I've been interviewing Marika Vroman Derning, a nurse writer, one of the original nurses turned writers. And I would like to thank my audience for tuning in today, whether you're listening on the podcast or watching us on YouTube. uh, Thank you so much. We appreciate your support. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel of the R Into Writer Show or subscribe, uh, follow us, I guess, is the correct lingo on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And until next week, keep pitching.